All right, so this is chapter 8 in the Huther book, and uh, but anyway, it's disorders of the immune response. Mainly we're going to be talking about hypersensitivities. We'll talk about HIV and AIDS and then some other uh, disorders that are that are kind of associated with the immune response, obviously. So one thing that we need to really talk about is uh, are the types of pathogens. I don't know uh, where you, most of you have kind of heard of most of these or learned them at some point, maybe in micro, if you've had it. But either way, we'll just cover it really quickly. So types of pathogens, prions, a lot of people don't really understand what prions are. Um, except for, you know, the definition, some small modified infectious host proteins that can alter other functional proteins. Okay, well, the the way to remember that is that you have the shape of a protein is, is really important. Uh, so, so this protein here I'm showing, it has to be shaped in that way. And of course, the amino acids have to be arranged in the right order um, for that shape and for the function. But, but there are other proteins, and I kind of drew this one shaped like a barrel here. There are other proteins that actually help to fold the proteins as they're being made. Okay, so they come through, and then this little barrel that I have drawn here will help to fold this protein the way it's supposed to be so that it's functional. Okay, what a prion is, is it's a modified version of this. They're called chaperone proteins, and so that's a, that's a good example of what might uh, be prion damage. And... Um, so instead of this working the way it's supposed to and folding this protein the way it's supposed to, maybe it's not functional and this protein is, is kind of messed up when it comes out and therefore that new protein won't work. So you can see where it would be really hard to come up with a treatment when it's actually a rogue protein or a malformed protein that is folding the proteins wrong or, or causing proteins to be folded wrong that are already folded. Um, so that can take place as well. Um, but anyway, so so that's what that's what a prion is. And and you know they they tend to manifest in the brain at first. Um, there are certain proteins that are that are mutated and they're usually chaperone proteins. But uh, you can see I mean you can't use antibiotics on it, you can't use antivirals on it because you would literally have to find that protein and kill that protein. So it's a very difficult thing to treat. Um, so that's what that's what a uh, a prion is. Some people call it prion. Uh, I've heard it called prion, and uh, I watched the guy who won the Nobel Prize for it talk about it, and I think that's the way he pronounced it. So that works for me. All right. So viruses. Viruses are just a a simple protein coat. So you have a bunch of proteins that kind of form a sphere. In some cases, they come in all shapes. But, and then if within that, I don't know why I made that so small, but within that you have like some single-stranded DNA or RNA, something, some very simple nucleic acid uh, chain that does basic functions for to keep that virus alive. Now the virus can't make its own ATP. It doesn't make enzymes for that kind of stuff. It has to rely on a host cell. So it can't really survive on its own. It can't survive on its own at all. It has to have a uh, it has to have a host to do its bidding to do its work for it um, bacteria is another is another thing I was gonna say that's also why viruses are are kind of hard to kill as as well they're they're really really simple bacteria are a little more complex they're still single-celled organisms but um, and they don't which means they don't have any organelles they don't really have a nucleus the the DNA just kind of exists inside this thing uh, but they can live independently. They release exotoxins, which means that the bacteria itself releases a, a substance that is toxic, okay, in, in the case of a uh, pathology. Or it may release endotoxins, and an endotoxin is really just part of the bacterial cell wall. Um, so when that bacteria falls apart, those little pieces of the cell wall are released, and that can be toxic as well. Um, there are also things called mycoplasms, rickettsia, chlamydia. Those are those are some uh, bacteria that are uh, a little bit different. They have a different type of cell wall. They might might have um, mycolic acid or something like that that is um, that makes them resistant to antibiotics. I think that's supposed to say antibiotics. So so that's another kind of subgroup of uh, of bacteria. Fungi are 
more complicated, most require a cooler temperature than human body core temperature, so they usually live on the surface of the body. Um, uh, candidiasis in the mouth uh, can be caused by like yeast, yeast infections, those, those are kind of counted among the fungi. Uh, parasites, uh, malaria, um, amoebic dysentery, giardiasis, giardiasis, and then helminths, which are roundworms, tapeworms, flukes, um, just ticks, mosquitoes, mites, lice, fleas. So these are these are multi, a lot of times multicellular organisms that are uh, a little bit larger. Okay, um, that that live. I mean, like the helminths and the arthropods, yeah, but I mean, but they but they live and uh, they they kind of feed off of their host. Okay, so how does infection take place? Well, direct contact with the pathogen could be one way. Ingestion could be a way. And a lot of these are a lot of these pathogens have sort of evolved to survive stomach acid or even relish stomach stomach acid is the case with like uh, stomach ulcers. Inhalation is another way that's a real quick access to to blood supply and uh, contact with uh, a zoonosis, zoonosis, where we get the word zoo, but it's zoo, uh, animal pathogens that can be transmitted to humans. There aren't very many animal pathogens that can be transmitted to humans, but there are some like, uh, oh, what is it, bird flu, stuff like that. So context, contact with a nosocomial infection. So a nosocomial, don't know if that's a new word for you, but nosocomial means that it is acquired in the hospital, okay? um, which is a pretty nasty place uh, when it comes right down to it because that's where sick people go. And so that's where a lot of uh, antibiotic uh, um, resistant strains of, of certain bacteria and pathogens can, can show up. Uh, contact with a fomite. So a fomite is another fancy word for just an object that can, uh, can hold on to pathogens. So usually, you know, you'll see a lot of stainless steel and smooth surfaces in a hospital because a lot of times those, uh, if you don't have that, something can uh, harbor like a bacteria. Bacteria can kind of live in it or even fungi can live in it and, and then be passed on. Uh, the example that it gave was a stethoscope. <clears throat> okay, so stages, stages of infection. So incubation stage, prodromal, acute, convalescent, and resolution. So we're kind of working our way through our, our actual infection. So, so the infection happens, and then there's a period of time where there is no there are no symptoms, and that's when the, if we use an example of a virus, the virus is replicating, it's moving into cells, it's dividing, and the immune system hasn't quite gotten control of it yet. And as it tends to do, as it does more and more damage, and there's more and more cell death, the immune system will notice it, and that's when it kind of moves toward the prodromal stage, which are early signs and symptoms like fever. So fever is a sign that it's a uh, systemic infection, and so that means that the immune system is releasing pyrogens or the immune cells, and um, and so you're starting to feel something. So fever and fatigue, and I have this quote here, I, I feel like I may be coming down with something. So you just start feeling not as good as you did. And then there's the acute stage, which is your maximum manifestation, signs and symptoms, and tissue damage and inflammation, all of that stuff is kind of at full force. So that's the acute stage. And then you start to get better. Okay, so the convalescent, you're containing, your immune system is containing the infection or it may be a treatment. You're eliminating the, the pathogen and you're trying to repair the damage. So that's convalescence and then resolution, that's total elimination and there are no residual manifestations. That means you're over it. So that's, um, that's resolution. Okay, some terms for infections. Itis means inflammation. Um, that's just what it means. It may or may not be due to an infection. I mean, you can get tendonitis from, you know, playing playing sports or something like that. So it may or may not be due to an infection, but it, it could go either way. Emia. Now, I'm going to circle this right here. Emia with an E means that it takes place in the blood. So septicemia would be sepsis that is taking place in the blood. Okay, and so I have that 
as an example here, and you're going to see this ending emia, the suffix emia, a lot. And anytime you see that with that e there, uh, emia, then that means that it's associated with the blood. So remember that. So virulence factors uh, make an infection more likely to cause disease. I already mentioned, um, I already mentioned exotoxins and endotoxins. Remember, a bacteria could release a toxin out into the uh, out into the fluid. And then that can that can trigger a uh, an immune response or uh, or septicemia. Uh, endotoxins endotoxins are part of the bacteria, so the bacteria is made up of a bunch of lipopolysaccharides, things like that. When that bacteria breaks down, those kind of move out too, and those can also uh, get the attention of your immune system. Okay, so adhesion factors help infective organisms stick organisms stick to the body. And uh, because it's, it has to somehow. So somehow the organism can't just slide off of you. It has to have some kind of a protein action that allows it to either, like bacteria have to grab, have to attach to the intestinal wall. Viruses have to attach to the cell that they're going to infect. So there's got to be some kind of adhesion factor. Evasive factors help keep the immune system from killing it, at least not killing it quickly. Okay, so it's got to kind of avoid uh, being taken out immediately by the innate immune system or some of these barriers. So it has to have some trick to help it to help it actually infect. Okay, immune responses. Um, we're going to talk about this one. So steps in the hypersensitive immune response and associated problems with that. We're also going to talk about some autoimmune diseases or autoimmune mechanisms is what we're going to talk about. We'll name some diseases and issues related to immunodeficiency disorders. So that's kind of our, our focus in this <clears throat> in this class, whatever. Okay, so this word, immune hypersensitivity. So we need to know, know that, know what that means because everybody will refer to these as hypersensitivities. I don't know about everybody, but that's what they're referred to. And what that means is that there is an excessive or inappropriate activation of the immune response. Our immune system is supposed to behave. And when it does gets a little bit ambitious, sometimes that can that's that's what we would refer to as a hypersensitivity. It's attacking things that it shouldn't be attacking or it's attacking things it should be attacking but it's it's releasing too much of something, okay? So the body is then damaged by the immune response rather than by the antigen or it could be damaged by both, but a lot of times with like pollen, that pollen's not going to hurt anything and yet your immune system kind of freaks out and that's where allergies come from. Okay, so there are four types of hypersensitivity and we'll go through each one of them in detail. Type 1, which is immediate, so that's a that's kind of a key word. It's the one that happens very quickly. Type 2 is antibody mediated. We'll explain what that means. Type 3, immune complex mediated. And I will say right now that these first three all involve antibodies. Just because type 2 is the only one that has antibody in the name uh, doesn't really mean these other two are also involving antibodies. And then type 4, and type 4 is T-cell mediated because it doesn't involve antibodies, it involves T-cells. Remember, antibodies were made by B-cells. All right, so kind of, the, kind of the same thing here as on the previous slide. Type 1 is immediate, immediate and it's IgE mediated. Okay? Um, and that's, we've talked about this a couple of times, but it's where IgE is put into mast cells. And then those can, when they're activated, like with some pollen or something like that, that binds to it, then that can cause it to degranulate and release things like histamine and other inflammatory uh, cytokines and signals. Um, to to cause to cause an immune response. Okay, so cross-linking of the antigen. So the antigen in this example would be some proteins associated with pollen leads to release of mast cell mediators. So we'll go through these in more detail. So I'll just try to read through these quickly. Type 2 antibody mediated. This is where this is where the plasma cells are actually producing antibodies that attack something in your body, something necessary. Okay, so that's a pretty direct attack by 
your antibodies, and that's why it's called antibody mediated. So they're tissue specific. It's actually it has identified some protein in the patient's body that it doesn't want there anymore. Okay, uh, for whatever reason. So it leads to complement mediated phagocytosis. So complement could get involved, inflammatory uh, signals and cell injury, physiological responses without cell injury, but somehow it's doing something somewhere and it's and it's mediated by these by antibodies specific to it. Type 3 is less specific. Okay? Uh, still involves antibodies, but in this case the antibodies are attacking something in the bloodstream. Okay, So there's your bloodstream and there's something that antibodies have identified as not wanting to have around anymore. Okay. Um, I don't know, I'm not doing a very good job of drawing these, but, but that's, that's the general, general idea, is, is they're all attacking it, and they form this complex, and then this complex will kind of, it's, it's almost like, you know, it just gets heavier and heavier and heavier, and then eventually it just sort of falls to the side, and, um, and then can cause the inflammatory signals to build up over here. Okay, and then and then type four are T cells. So similar to type two, which is antibody mediated, type four involve T cells, and the T cells are what are sp specifically attacking something and then causing a uh, type of immune response. All right. So again, I told you we're going to go through these in more detail. So here we go with type one. It's immediate commonly called allergic reaction. So on an exam, when you're trying to figure out, okay, is this type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, if it's immediate, that's one thing to remember. I mean, if it's happening right away, then it's probably going to be a type 1. So that's usually a clue. Um, it's mediated by immunoglobulin E. Now remember, B cells are what and uh, I'll, I have I'll have B cells here, but then I'm going to erase it because the B cells actually turn into something called plasma cells. Plasma cells are what make antibodies, okay? And they produce these antibodies and they just sort of send them out. Now, most of the time, the most abundant one is IgG, but they also can make IgE. Now IgE have this special quality, and it's really the mast cells that have this quality, where they have little binding sites, little landing sites for IgE antibodies. And so these IgE antibodies, even though they were made by plasma cells, will find themselves inside, kind of on the on the cell surface of mast cells. And it's a uh, it's an immune response because let's let's use pollen as an example, because at some point along the way you inhaled pollen. Okay? Whatever it happens to be you're allergic to. It could be a food allergy as well. So you you somehow got this in your system and it and it caused an immune response and the ultimate production of plasma cells that are producing these antibodies. Well as the plasma cells produce these antibodies, the IgE forms will go and and embed themselves into mast cells and then when the pollen shows up again this is supposed to be cross-linked there uh, when the pollen shows up again then it will cause these to these mast cells to degranulate and they release inflammatory mediators cytokines histamine is a big one so they're going to release this histamine and then cause um, a number of symptoms like uh, hives, urticaria, hives, um, rhinitis, which is hay fever, dermatitis, so that's that's uh, itchiness or or like a like kind of a raised rash usually, uh, bronchial allergic asthma, so it could cause your smooth muscle to tighten up in your bronchi and cut off your air supply, and then food allergies, which which can show you know a number of these symptoms as well. So it may, may result in systemic or even anaphylactic, okay, which is which is a uh, heightened sort of um, system-wide reaction. Okay, um, so the mechanism. So I already kind of went over the mechanism of type one. 
um, upon initial exposure, there's no allergic re response. And then it goes through, and I'll refer you back to covering the immune system, it goes through that entire process where um, T helper cells are exposed to it, usually through a macrophage or some kind of antigen presenting. They cause B cells to produce IgE. The B cells are also producing IgG, but they produce IgE antibody, and that an IgE antibody coats these, um, wherever they are, coats these mast cells. Okay, so this step here. So coats the mast cells. And so that what so the first time you're exposed, you really don't have a reaction, but then the subsequent times that you were exposed, this is all ready to go. And as soon as those allergens come in, they bind and they cause an immediate or very quick release of um, of of the uh, like the histamine and the other the other things in these granules of the mast cells. So primary early response, vasodilation, vas vascular damage, smooth muscle spasm. Uh, and then it kind of moves on. Well, we have a list of, of what, it, what it can do. So, so when the subsequent allergen binds, it, uh, it leads to the release of these mediators. So examples of local, and then I've already mentioned these, rhinitis, food allergies, bronchial asthma, hives, atopic dermatitis. Allergens. Now, people who are allergic to something, uh, all of us have you know, allergies on some level it may not be very noticeable, but individuals, um, some individuals are, are very allergic to a lot of different things. So most individuals are commonly allergic to more than one allergen, uh, but some people have, have a real problem with it. And there's kind of a good reason. And that is because, like I said, um, these plasma cells are producing IgG, but they're also producing IgE. And people who have allergic reactions tend to have um, higher concentrations of IgE and they have more receptors for it on the mast cells. Remember those little landing pads I talked about on the mast cells? There are more of those on their mast cells and so it's going to cause a hypersensitivity. Those mast cells are going to be more sensitive to, um, to the allergen whenever it, whenever it presents itself. Okay, so again, food allergies, rhinitis, dermatitis, bronchial asthma, pollens, molds, fungi, foods, animals, all of these, all of these things tend to be a type 1 type of, um, of hypersensitivity, especially if it's something that presents quickly. Okay, uh, so the allergen may be contained within a particle too large to be phagocytosed or is protected by a non-allergenic coat, and then eosinophils will get involved. So if it's if it's too big, then um, to be taken out quickly, then eosinophils can get involved, and eosinophils are also involved in certain allergies. All right. Um, okay. So the phases. Oops. Where did where did my thing go? Oh, there it is. So phases. First phase is the initial early response, and that's five to five to thirty minutes. Okay. And that lasts about 60 minutes, and that's where you have this mast cell degranulation. And that's where you'll see those things I started to talk about earlier, vasodilation, vascular increase in vascular permeability, so that's going to lead to vascular leakage, uh, smooth muscle contraction, that's where you have the, uh, the asthma, the allergen-associated asthma. And then there's, there's a second phase, or there can be a second phase, or a late response, and that occurs in two to eight hours and may last for days. And that's where you kind of have a handoff. Remember, histamine is, is one of these things that can cause this vasodilation and, and increase in, in uh, vascular permeability. Um, but, the, but, it's, but histamine usually happens, you know, it's released, it happens very quickly, and then, it, and then it goes away fairly quickly. But then it turns on those cell processes. Remember those cell processes? They're called here lipid mediators. Remember prostaglandins? Well, that might get turned on, and then you might have a longer-lasting type of effect. Okay, so it takes a little longer for prostaglandins to get going, but they tend to stick around. And leukotrienes, leukotrienes are also going to cause asthma symptoms, but they're made almost in the same exact way as prostaglandins. Okay, so all of these things together increase infiltration of eosinophils, which leads to destruction of epithelial cell components. Remember, eosinophils are there to kill fungi and worms and big things. And so they play, they release all of these toxins 
and when they're activated, thinking, oh, I'm going to kill a bug, and what they end up doing is they end up killing your own cells, okay? So they can cause some, some tissue damage. Uh, they can damage the mucosal edema, so they can cause mucosal edema, um, mucus secretion, leukocyte infiltration, epithelial damage, bronchospasm. So um, these things together, this process can, can cause some, some serious harm. Um, so there's this, and one of the, one of the things that can, can really happen that we can get concerned about is when it becomes a systemic response. Okay, so, so when this hypersensitivity is happening and immune cells, cytokines are being released, the immune system suddenly has a system-wide response. Instead of being a local area where the allergen uh, came in, it, it goes to the entire body, and it kind of follows a, a pattern. Okay, so systemic response, that's what anaphylaxis is. Um, Systemic response to inflammatory mediators released in type 1 hypersensitivity okay, often results from injected or ingested allergens. Okay? And, and if you think about it, that kind of makes sense. If you have something that you know, gets on your skin, you may have an inflammatory reaction right away. If you inhale something, you might have something that happens in your nose or in your nasal cavity. But if it's injected or ingested, that means it kind of quickly gets to the bloodstream. And that's where this can really can really go uh, systemic very quickly. So all, only a small amount of allergen may be required to produce a reaction, and you have system-wide vasodilation. So instead of just being in that one area where you have vasodilation, now you have vasodilation all through the body, and bronchoconstriction, your your you know your uh, bronchi will kind of close up. And these two things together, when you have vasodilation, systemic vasodilation, when you dilate a blood vessel, it tends to drop pressure. When it happens all over the body, it tends to drop pressure a lot. Okay, So now you have blood pressure dropping. Um, people can lose consciousness, bronchoconstriction. Now you're cutting off air supply. This is a this is kind of an emergent situation. So anaphylactic shock. So anaphylactic shock is, is what happens when the blood pressure drops so much that you can't perfuse your organs. Your organs start to starve uh, because you can't get enough blood flow to them because your blood pressure has dropped so much. Okay, so that's vasodilation and loss of fluid as exudate can lead to a rapid decrease in blood volume and pressure. Okay because all the, all the fluid is moving out of the bloodstream and, and into, uh, into the extracellular fluid or into the interstitial fluid. Okay, so overview, the body is exposed to an in external substance, antigen, pollen, or whatever, pet dander. The immune system interprets the antigen as a foreign invader, which it is, it just kind of overreacts. In allergic in individuals, the immune system then makes an unusual response that harms the body, and that's where we talk about al allergies and hypersensitivity. So sensitization occurs, plasma cells produce an antibody to the antigen IgE that binds to mast cells, and then when it happens again, then these mast cells will release their, their mediators uh, very, very quickly. Okay? And histamine is the, is the best example of, a, uh, of one of those mediators, although there are others. Okay, so it is the effects of mediators on organs and cells that cause these symptoms of allergic reactions. Now, you can get a shot, immunotherapy, you can get an allergy shot of something like Ig. So what you're doing is you're stimulating plasma cells to produce more IgG. And if they produce more IgG, Okay, so remember, this is just your immune system being activated. So if you get a shot of whatever this, this substance is, the pollen or whatever, um, then it's going to stimulate your immune system to produce this IgG. And then the IgG will be out there kind of taking out this allergen before it can, be effect, before it can affect the mast cells. Okay, does that kind of make sense? If you, since the mast cells are kind of sitting there with those little antibodies on them, the IgG is sort of waiting for the pollen. Then the way it, the way I picture it is then, if you have enough, if you have more of this IgG in your blood, then what happens is this will come down, swoop down, take that, and take them out. Okay, 
And so those are those are uh, allergens that can no longer bind to mast cells. So it reduces the symptoms. So antibodies against the allergen will form IgG, and net exposure to this antigen leads to less severe allergic reactions with smaller manifestations, and that's because the IgGs are attacking the allergen, uh, which then doesn't allow it to bind as much to the IgE on the mast cells. Okay, <clears throat> so, so remember I said that the first three, one through three, all involve antibodies, and we saw how it involved antibodies in type one with the IgG and the IgE. Type two is called antibody-mediated because it actually attacks antigens on cell surface, okay? Um, now, do you also remember when we talked about IgM? Remember that's the one that was kind of, kind of star-shaped. I don't know, I'm drawing this poorly. Oops, whatever. But it's kind of, kind of snowflake-shaped or star-shaped or whatever. Um, it's big. But that's also, remember I said that's involved with the A, B, and O, lack of it, a blood type group, and that's what kind of attacks A and B blood. Well, um, so that's, that's kind of, that's going to fall into the type 2 hypersensitivity. So keep that in mind. Often involves antigens on red or white blood cells. Transfusion reactions, so when somebody uh, gets a blood transfusion or, you know, an organ donation that involves also blood. RH disease, except RH is going to involve IgG, not IgM. And then drug reactions. Drug, the, uh, the antibodies can... Uh, the drugs can actually change cell surfaces and so the your antibodies will recognize something it didn't used to. Okay, or, or it didn't previously. All right, so mechanism of type two. Tissue specific. Understand what this means. Tissue specific. That means that there is a particular cell or a particular protein on a cell that the immune system recognizes. Um, an example is um, like we can, there's a disease where you can cause, have, make antibodies against a certain collagen protein. Okay, collagen is everywhere in the body, but there are certain collagen proteins that exist only in, um, only in the lungs and the kidneys. So now, for whatever reason, your immune system is producing antibodies against those specific tissues. It's the kidneys and the lungs, specifically the glomerulus. Okay? It's called good pasture syndrome. It's on the next slide. So tissue-specific reaction leads to complement mediated phagocytosis. So that could be a method. I mean, because you put an antibody on there, you tag it for complement. Um, inflammation, cell injury, or a physiological response that doesn't necessarily include cell injury. But either way, um, this, is, this is kind of the same thing, and it's listed on the next slide too. But antibodies on red blood cells, so we mentioned that. Complement mediated, we mentioned that. Graves' disease. Now, Graves' disease is a little bit different. So let's kind of take a moment, moment and think about this. What happens is you have something called thyroid stimulating hormone receptors, so TSH receptors, that are on your thyroid cells of the thyroid gland. So there's a TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone receptor, and you or the patient will suddenly start producing antibodies that bind with those thyroid stimulating hormone receptors and activate them. And that's really weird because usually when an antibody binds to something, it deactivates it. But in this case, it's actually activating these receptors, causing you to produce more thyroid hormone. So you, you're producing, your it's hyperthyroidism. You're producing way too much thyroid hormone. And, and it's caused by a type 2 hypersensitivity. It's tissue specific because it's only doing it to these uh, thyroid stimulating hormone receptors. Okay, so Graves' disease, antibody stimulates the thyroid. Myasthenia gravis makes a little more sense because in this case, and that's this picture over here, 
In this case, the antibodies are attacking acetylcholine receptors. Now remember, acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that causes muscle contractions. So if you have certain antibodies that are coming down and taking out some of your acetylcholine receptors, then that's going to be sort of um, perceived as weakness when you when you go to contract your muscles and you have fewer of these acetylcholine receptors then then you might not have um, some of those muscle cells may not contract the way that you expect them to okay but again it's tissue specific that's going to happen wherever there are acetylcholine receptors so we think of, of muscle okay as, as being one of the one of the main places where it shows up all right, so complement antibody-mediated cell destruction, inflammation, de cell dysfunction. We already mentioned that. Uh, IgG or IgM, so remember that, that those are the uh, immunoglobulins that are affected. Binds antigens on cells of surface, so Graves' disease, we mentioned that. Antibodies stimulate thyroid hormone release. Myasthenia gravis, acetylcholine receptors are blocked, okay, so that means they kind of go away and some of them go away not all of them you die but some of them go away and that causes weakening and decreased function is what it says here good pasture syndrome that's the one i mentioned it's a uh, it's it's an attack against a certain type of collagen that's found in the kidneys and the lungs so glomerulus and alveoli and then the red and white red or white blood cells so transfusion reactions and then the hemolytic disease of newborns that's the rh factor okay so that's when the baby is rh positive and mom starts to form antibodies which are igg mom can form antibodies against this rh factor that exists on the outside of cells blood cells okay, it's different than a b it's uh, RH, and mom could make antibodies. If mom is RH negative, she will not like to see this, this RH factor. She'll see that new protein as foreign, and she will make antibodies against it. And since IgG, kind of an important point here, since IgG can cross the placenta, IgG, can cross the placenta, that means if moms make an antibodies, they're going to get to the fetus, and they can just they can attack the fetus's blood. Okay, um, drug reaction: penicillin binds to cells, and then the antibodies attack those blood cells. So um, I don't know exactly what the protein is. There are a lot of different proteins on the cell, on on blood cells, but if penicillin is given and it binds to a certain protein on the cell surface or lipo lipid or whatever on the cell surface then you could produce antibodies against that okay okay just just this combination of the two so maybe in some cases the penicillin is kind of floating around and being ignored but then when it actually binds it uh, the immune system recognizes that as being foreign for whatever reason all right, so um, again, a reminder, the IgM, so these are IgM, see how large they are, are unable to cross the placenta, so that means if mom is type A and the fetus is type B, doesn't matter, because even if mom wants to make antibodies against the, whatever I said the baby's blood type was, then it wouldn't matter because it wouldn't be able to cross over into, because remember, they don't share blood baby has its blood its uh, circulatory system mom has hers it's just some of these products you know like well oxygen sugar smaller things can move across so she gives her she gives nutrients provides nutrients but these antibodies are too big uh, but remember because rh factor is attacked by igg and it's smaller she can attack a baby the fetus if it's RH, if it has that RH, if it's RH positive. Okay, so that was type two. Now we're gonna move on to type three. Type three is a little, a little different. Um, if you understand it though, everything kind of clicks and makes sense. So we were calling type two antibody mediated because those antibodies attacked a specific protein or a specific cell or tissue. Type three, yeah, the antibody's still going to have some specificity, 
The problem is, or the issue is, that it's it's attacking something that's floating around in the blood. Okay, so so here it is in the blood, and it's attacking something that's floating around in here. Okay. Now, whatever whatever that is, in the case of lupus, they've they've identified it as like rogue DNA or something like that. But but either way, I'm not sure what I've just done here. But either way, you have antibodies that are attacking these things, and when they do, they tend to form clumps. That's what I mentioned earlier. They tend to form clumps, and that's what we kind of see here, is we see the antibodies individually out there, and then the antigen, whatever that happens to be, when the antibodies attack it it groups it up, forms this clump, and this clump falls out of solution and will attach to the vessel wall, the blood vessel wall. Think about that. We can't call it tissue specific because, yeah, it, it, it formed on the blood vessel wall, but not because it was attacking the blood vessel. It was attacking something that was floating around. It just fell out of solution and now that it's in this area, it's going to launch a full-on immune, at least inflammatory response in that area. Okay, So where is it happening? Wherever it happened to fall out of solution. Now a lot of times it happens in the kidneys, it may happen in the lungs, it may happen in the spleen. Um, so there are lots of the liver, it's a big one. So it could happen just about anywhere, but and so you can't really say that it's tissue specific which it's not, okay? So, let's read through this. Free-floating antigen plus an antibody uh, creates a circulating immune complex, and then that cir circulating immune complex sort of gets, in my head, this is the way it works, it gets sort of too big and weighted down, and it falls out and attaches to the cell wall. So complex deposits on walls of blood vessels, or sorry, the vessel wall. So deposits on the wall of blood vessels and activates complement, among other things. It's going to activate an entire inflammatory response. Um, leads to recruitment, which is what, what this says, okay. So leads to recruitment and activation of inflammatory cells that release tissue damaging products. Blood vessels are damaged and wherever that happens to be. If it's in the glomerulus of the kidney, then you're going to have symptoms of kidney failure, kidney disease. Um, okay, so antigen antibody complex are formed in the circulation and are later deposited in vessel walls or extravascular tissues, damages blood vessels, ultimately may damage kidneys, and another one, like in rheumatoid arthritis, can damage joints. Okay, so it's autoimmune, but it's not we can't, if it's a type 3, we can't say that it's attacking the joints. It's not attacking the joints. That's just where this um, floating complex happens to have collected. And so it does damage the joints. It's just not doing it on purpose. It has nothing against the joints. That's just where the complex fell out of solution. Okay, so it's not organ specific because it isn't really attacking a specific cell type. Causes uh, most common. Um, antibiotics. So antibiotics can kind of get out there and if your immune system as the as the antibiotics are floating through your uh, bloodstream then then the antibodies can attack those and cause this type 3 hypersensitivity. Uh, can also be food, different foods, drugs, and I know we mentioned some of this stuff with uh, with type 1 but that's why it's important to understand the mechanism because that's how they are different and that's how the test will ask questions about them. Um, so free-floating antigens, so anything, anything that's uh, that's out there. So some examples: autoimmune vasculitis, uh, glomerulonephritis. We'll talk about what that is when we talk about kidneys. Systemic lupus and rheumatoid arthritis that we that we already men mentioned. All right. Um, now we move on to type four. Uh, this is delayed. Okay, so remember the first one was immediate and type 4 is delayed and it's also cell mediated. Now this is going to tie some other things back together because when we think of immunity, what do we think of as being cell mediated immunity? I hope you're saying to yourself T cells, okay, because that's the right answer. T cells cause cell mediated immunity. So the T cells respond to an antigen and then travel to that location. Okay, so remember T cells and B cells, we like to say they live in the lymph, but they travel. 
they move out, they go into the lymph, they hang out there for a little while, and then they'll go back into the bloodstream. So they are circulating. Uh, you just find more of them in the lymph. So as these T cells, they, they find their way to an antigen that has shown up somewhere, um, travel to that location and activate a more sustained immune response at that location or tissue type. So they're actually going to that location and there is a T cell mediated response. So uh, direct cell mediated cytotoxicity. T helper cells can get involved uh, to kind of turn up the uh, response, but cytotoxic T cells are really what's going to cause the damage to the cell. So, so the tissue damage, but then that's going to trigger the, the helper T cells and the cytotoxic T cells are both going to send out cytokine signals that can cause uh, inflammation. Okay. Inflammation, which may involve itching. Okay, so viral reactions ultimately may involve macrophages. Sure, I mean that makes that makes sense. But the important thing to remember is that you don't have, like in type 1, where you had those IgEs just sitting there waiting, you don't have that with this. It's, so it is delayed. You need to give time for those T cells to see and recognize whatever that, um, whatever that antigen was. So some, some types of contact dermatitis, poison ivy, nickel jewelry, so nickel allergies if you need to wear hypoallergenic jewelry or you'll start to itch. Uh, but again, poison ivy, after you're exposed, it usually takes a day to, uh, to actually start showing symptoms, and that's because you have to let the T cells get down there to do their thing. Um, the TB test is another one where it's going to be T cell mediated. You put in some kind of a uh, antigen, and then you wait to see if you have T cells that are going to respond to it. And if you do, that means you've been exposed to TB before, but that's also why you have to wait a day or a couple of days to read the TB test because you have to wait for that reaction to take place. Uh, multiple sclerosis, that is uh, a disease of um, the myelin sheath and the myelin and myelin protein. And so the T cells are affecting or act, or if you don't remember what myelin is, it's the sheath around neurons. And, um, and so you actually have T cells that are attacking myelin protein and killing those myelin sheaths and ultimately will kill the neuron. Okay, so this is the only hypersensitivity response that does not uh, involve antibodies. All right, so a little more about it. Uh, type 4 cell mediated hypersensitivity, CD4 T cells delayed or CD8 T cell cytolysis. So uh, either way, it's going to be T cells that are, that are involved working together uh, for the most part. Leads to sensitized T cells which cause cell and tissue injury and the release of inflammatory factors. Okay, And this just sort of shows what happens with poison ivy. There are certain molecules, in this case catechol, which is a chemical group, molecules, that react with certain skin proteins of some people. Okay, some people it'll react with them, some people it will not. But if it does react to them and the immune system recognizes it, so uh, maybe that's the difference is in some people the immune system recognizes it, some people it doesn't. But either way, it's these molecules combining with skin proteins that suddenly make this a target and a target specifically for T cells. Okay. So uh, one to two days, the memory T cells, many active cells, and that's when you start showing signs of inflammation. These T, um, these T cells are going to send out inflammatory signals. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So an overview, I'm actually not going to read through this, uh, but I suggest you spend time looking at it because it kind of breaks down everything that, that we just said. I noticed here, that I have insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus or type 1 diabetes as listed as a, as a type 4. Um, but don't get too hung up on, on some of these because a lot of times you'll see that a certain disease could be a couple of different types or it could be listed as, as a couple of different types. It may start out as a type 1 and then change to a, a type 3 or something like that. So uh, it's really important that you understand the mechanism rather than just sort of memorizing which 
which diseases and allergies are which type of hypersensitivity. Okay, now, so we'll talk about, so we're going to move on to solid organ graft rejection. Remember the, remember MHC, major histocompatibility complex protein, uh, it's, MHC is made, is a protein that's made by a gene called HLA, which means human, human leukocyte antigen. Uh, that's, that's actually part of the DNA. So HLA and MHC are pretty much kind of can be used interchangeably. Not the same thing, but they can be used interchangeably. Uh, so the immune system attacks as though the donated organ is an infectious microbe. Oh, what I was going to say about that is the closer that those MHC molecules are genetically between the donor and the recipient, the more, the higher the chance that that organ donation is going to be successful. The, uh, but of course we know that it isn't always successful, even, even taking those precautions. So, um, so we do end up with, after organ transplants, we do end up with some organ rejection. We're talking about solid organs now as opposed to blood. So T-cell response can be a T-cell response, leads to endothelial cell death, which leads to ischemia of the organ. Pay attention to this. Endothelial cell death, that means blood vessels. Okay. Um, so blood vessels are endothelial cell death, and then if you don't have blood vessels, if the blood vessels are being killed, then that's going to kill the organ. Okay, it triggers inflammation with increased vascular permeability, local accumulation of lymphocytes and macrophages, and the immune system just tries to get rid of the organ. That's kind of sad. T cells play a role in acute and chronic rejection. Um, humoral rejection has, has three forms. So now we're talking so solid rejection involving T cells is going to attack the blood vessels. But there can also be some other problems that are involved with, um, with organ uh, donations. And that is, and this is, so in the first one, we'll just go through these. In the first one, hyperacute, this has to do with uh, like blood in one case, in this case. And that's going to be the antibody, type 2 hypersensitivity. And, and so if you don't match the blood type or if there is an obvious antibody, that the host immune system has already seen and does not want around, then you're going to see a very, very fast rejection. Okay, so it's it's going to reject it just because the blood types are different. It's just going to turn the gels to the blood to gel almost immediately. So it may show up during surgery, um, and it's uh, if it's an accidental ABO mismatch, then that's going to be a type two. Acute is so hyperacute means that it's happening, like I said, during surgery. Acute means it happens quickly, um, but and that's the most common, okay? because we try to do everything we can to avoid hyperacute. But this may take weeks or months, and it tends to be a type four. Remember, type four is T cell mediated, and its uh, destruction could be from antibody or cell mediated or complement system. So um, this this says type four hypersensitivity. Um, and this says can be from antibodies, which indicates that it's a different type. So really, it has to do with um, how long it's taking. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. That's kind of an important point to say that it's not. You can't really target it and say it's usually going to be type four. But this kind of indicates that it can also be uh, antibody mediated. Um, so destruction can be from antibody or cell mediated or complement system. It could be that the organ is damaged and that's going to release other antigens and then the, um, the antibodies can be raised against those. So maybe it starts out as a type 4 and then can turn into a type 2 and that happens frequently with a lot of different diseases. Okay, so destruction can be from antibody or cell mediated or the complement system or inflammation, but the target is usually the blood vessels. Okay, so remember that. Uh, type 4 T cell mediated T cells move to the location and release signals to trigger other immune responses. So basically it works the way a type 4 does in the case that it's uh, that it starts out as a type 4 hypersensitivity. Okay. But the most important thing is to remember the blood vessels are involved and you ultimately have ischemia and inflammatory responses that follow. 
All right, so chronic rejection. Chronic rejection, we really don't know what's happening here, but it's slow and progressive, may take months to years. The organ could just start wearing down much more quickly. So there is some rejection that's taking place, but it's not as urgent. It's not telling you you need to get rid of it within you know a few days, that which may happen with acute. Uh, so organ atrophy over time, and there really is no treatment for uh, for chronic. Now, what if someone has um, leukemia or something like that, and they aren't able to, um, they don't have a healthy immune system, they've been through radiation, they've, it's killed a lot of their white blood cells, and so you have someone donate bone marrow to them so they can start producing healthy white blood cells again. Okay? So something has happened that caused somebody to not be able to produce white blood cells. They need a transfusion or they need a donor to donate bone marrow to them so because that's where the, the leukocytes and blood cells are made. Now, in the case of graft versus host disease, that means that whoever is donating the bone marrow, this is supposed to be a bone, even though it's usually from like the pelvis, whoever is donating that bone marrow has such a healthy immune system or non-compatible immune system that when that bone marrow enters the host, I don't know why I drew the host as a square, but when that bone marrow enters the host, it will start attacking the host. Okay, So we call the donated bone marrow, we call that a graft, Okay, and the host is the host. So the name of this is very accurate. It is graft versus host disease. So that means that the occurs mainly in bone marrow and transplants and immunocompromised patients who receive blood products with uh, like their MHCs don't match the way they were supposed to, something that is incompatible with the bone marrow of the host versus the recipient to the point that the donor's T cells will attack the host. Okay, So it will actually attack the, um, the, uh, the MHC. Okay? Uh, the major histocompatibility complex proteins if they don't if they don't match so that's graft versus host I just I make a big deal about that because I don't know it's easy to to slip and think that the host is attacking whatever was donated but really it's whatever was donated aka bone marrow is attacking the host so it presents often as a pruritic or itchy skin rash that sloughs off and this is how you know this is what you watch for if somebody has a bone marrow transplant and they start to have these symptoms then it usually means that the donor's bone marrow is attacking or the leukocytes are attacking the host all right, so you must have the following for graft versus host disease to develop. A transplant has to have functional cellular immune component, bone marrow. Okay, the recipient tissue has foreign antigens to the donor, so they're not compatible. And the recipient immunity is compromised, so it can't fight back. It can't destroy those, those uh, transplanted cells. Okay, so it usually involves T cells and also natural killer cells. All right, so this is um, some... A kind of a breakdown of what we just talked about: hyperacute, acute, chronic, chronic. Whoa! Not sure what happened here. Um, sorry, my sorry, my iPad just decided to turn on. Okay, uh, so I'm going to let you you look this over on your own, and um, uh, and because we already just kind of covered that. Okay, so autoimmune diseases, normally self-reactive. So this is where uh, we've already mentioned a couple of autoimmune diseases. So um, we'll just kind of go through this very quickly. Normally, self-reactive immune to cells are destroyed or suppressed. That's called self-tolerance. So what I'm, what I'm getting at here is self-tolerance means that your immune system won't attack yourself. Okay, so that's the idea of it. I know that's common sense. We've already kind of covered that, but but this is this is the term. Um, so self-tolerance is the inability for your own immune system to to mount an immune response against you. Okay, so that's how it should work. Um, in autoimmunity, that self-tolerance breaks down and the immune system does attack itself and it destroys body tissues. Things like uh, type 1 diabetes is an example, this myasthenia gravis that we were 
that we referred to earlier. Uh, so central tolerance means that um, that you eliminate self-reactive T cells from the thymus and self-reactive B cells from the bone marrow. Okay, so that's what central tolerance is. Peripheral tolerance means that something has made it through uh, detection in the bone marrow and the thymus, so something that reacts to itself, and then then it's destroyed later on. Okay, so that's so there is a a backup sort of to eliminate things that respond to uh, to uh, your own immune Im immune system. Okay, so mechanisms of autoimmune disorders: a genetic predisposition for, plus a trigger event. So what that what that really gets to is that we know that there's a genetic component because someone they've done twin studies where if one person develops an autoimmune disorder, there's like a 50 to 80 percent chance, depending on which autoimmune disease you're talking about. I don't know specifically enough to give numbers right now. But, but there's a really good chance that the identical twin will also develop the autoimmune disorder, but it isn't guaranteed, okay? So, so 80% doesn't mean that it's genetic only, so an 80% chance. So if one identical twin gets it, 80% chance the other does, it's not a sure thing. So that means there has to be something else. So we say a genetic predisposition plus a trigger event. Something had to trigger it. Um, whether that's a, a disease, which we see down here kind of with molecular mimicry, which we'll get to. So estrogen, many autoimmune diseases are more common in women than men. And so uh, I guess the idea is that estrogen may play a role. Estrogen receptors, activation of estrogen receptors uh, may, may play a role in that. Um, breakdown in T-cell energy. So that's not a misspelling. That's actually with an A. And really that just means there's an absence of, of the immune response. That's what energy is supposed to be. And so when the immune system is supposed to be subdued, so that's what this is talking about. When the immune system is supposed to be subdued, there are um, suppressor cells that are supposed to kind of turn down the immunity when it's not needed it doesn't happen and so it's so that 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 process breaks down and you have an active immune system when you shouldn't have an active immune system uh, the release of sequestered antigens so sometimes um, like something could build up in like adipose tissue or something like that and then if you lose a bunch of weight those those antigens that kind of you know slowly and surely got built up in these uh, in the adipose tissue as that adipose tissue starts to break down or muscle or anything else that might break down but it releases those antigens and when it does um, the uh, that can cause an immune response which would probably be honestly a type 3 type of reaction because these are going to float around and then you're going to have that um, that immune uh, complex that would form Okay, um, <clears throat> molecular mimicry. A foreign antigen closely resembles a self-antigen. So antibodies formed against a foreign antigen. This is something, to kind of make sense out of this, this is something we kind of see sometimes with viruses. So um, like Epstein-Barr virus. So somebody gets infected with like strep throat and then and then, which is different I know, but but somebody might get infected with strep throat and then a couple of weeks later start showing signs of an autoimmune disease and that's because some of the proteins in the bacteria or the virus are so similar to that the uh, the patient's anti antigens the patient's proteins that the in the process of the immune system fighting off the virus then after the virus is gone it's the t immune system is turned up and it might recognize some of that patient's um, proteins as being the same. Okay, does that does that kind of make sense? It's uh, it's just kind of uh, it's confused. I mean, that's kind of the way to look at it. It it was trying really hard to fight off this virus, but then you have a protein or the patient has a protein that looks very similar to some of the viral proteins and so the immune system just attacks those two. Uh, and then there's something called super antigens which really um, you know really well, all they do is you know your MHC is supposed to be holding on to these uh, these antigens 
and it's supposed to be processed in here and then it's supposed to be put out here. Super antigens just boot off whatever's there and just activate the T cells. Okay, So super antigens, I, I guess it's okay to just think of it according to the name. They're antigens that have a really heightened immune response. They really activate the immune system without really getting into the mechanism. Um, they activate immune response without processing or presentation. They don't go through any of these checks. Okay, um, type 3 autoimmune examples, systemic lupus erythematosus, SLE, is um, it's a type 3. Remember, so, so that means that we have the immune complex that forms, falls out of solution, and attacks the vessel wall and anything else wherever that vessel is. Uh, so more common in females, manifestations, arthralgia, joint pain. So joints are a place that this, that this can happen, this type 3 response can happen, because we've seen that with rheumatoid arthritis as well. Um, vasculitis and rash, so skin problems, renal problems because pro primarily because of the glomerulus and how you know you have these uh, this little area here this little capillary ball and that's a great place for these guys these uh, circulating complexes to kind of fall out of solution uh, hematological cha changes uh, bone marrow uh, cardiovascular disease so maybe if it gets into the uh, coronary arteries the coronary system and then rheumatoid arthritis is is another one Okay, so uh, circulating immune complexes containing antibodies, more common in females, and rheumatoid arthritis is associated with redness, swelling, and painful joints. So you can kind of associate these with, with, a, uh, with a type 3. That's pretty safe, although I can show you things that um, show that there are other uh, hypersensitivity types associated with uh, at least rheumat or, uh, lupus. Okay, so let's move on now and talk about immunodeficiency. Immunodeficiency just means that the immune system isn't doing what it was supposed to do. So we just got done talking about hypersensitivities. Now we're talking about deficiency. So there are a couple of different categories, I guess. There's primary, which, um, which means that it just sort of happens. It's genetic, and, uh, and that could be you know humoral which would be involved with B cells could be T cells that aren't working right so there's some kind of a genetic mutation that's causing your B cells and or T cells to not function the way that it's supposed supposed to there's a disease called severe combined immunodeficiency um, and uh, skid I've actually worked with skid mice and we had to keep them in a clean environment um, with uh, with special cages uh, because they would get a disease just really really easily and die okay so acquired which is what we're going to spend most of our time talking on so these up here were mostly genetic acquired means that something happened to cause it so malnutrition if you don't have enough if you're not getting nutrients then you can't really support your immune system um, immunosuppressant drugs especially if you are a, a transplant recipient you could be on immunosuppressant drugs, which is going to increase your chances of getting sick. And then the one we're getting ready to talk about, um, HIV and AIDS. All right. Um, so human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. Uh, HIV is, is, a, is a retrovirus. Okay? And a retrovirus in general means that, and this is sneaky, means that this virus has RNA inside it, but it will actually turn its RNA into DNA and then upload itself into the host's DNA. Okay, so it'll just insert itself right into the host's DNA, just right there. Just puts it puts it right itself right in there. Sorry, this is just amazing that something like this can happen. Okay, and that's what a retrovirus does. And now when this and this this happens in helper T cells primarily. Okay, or CD4. 
there are, there are CD4 cells that aren't helper T cells, but it's mainly the helper T cells that we're concerned about with HIV or AIDS. Um, so yeah, and then then when this helper T cells is is activated be, because there's an immune, you know, that it's being infected, then it will actually just turn on more and more of these as it it's going to turn on the now DNA from the virus and start making more viral proteins. Okay, so that's kind of how this happens. Um, so HIV is, that's what a retrovirus is in general. So primarily affects CD4 helper T cells, um, transmitted by body fluids, sexual content, uh, contact, breast milk, blood to blood contact. So something that is, uh, is causing it to, um, something that allows it to get from, from blood to blood essentially. Um, is, is the main way. So contaminated needles, transfusion during pregnancy or birth, and then HIV, and kind of remember this, or don't kind of remember this, remember this number. Uh, for HIV to be considered AIDS, there has to be a CD4 count of less than 200 per milliliter, 200 cells per milliliter. And so that's a number that you really keep an eye on with, with patients, with HIV patients. And then when they do reach less than 200, then there has to be a discussion about whether or not we're going to treat this as full-blown AIDS. Because then you start on something called heart therapy, which is a, a highly active antiretroviral therapy or something like that. I think that's right. Um, but, but to start on that, that treatment, you can't really go off that treatment. So it's really kind of a, uh, a big decision between the doctor and the patient as to whether or not we're going to finally just give in and call this HIV or call this AIDS. All right, um, so the question, how does HIV, and I'm actually going to, to move to the text version of this, um, the steps of HIV replication. So how does HIV infect? And we'll just go through there and I'll just kind of draw out what's on the slide before. So the first thing that has to happen, we'll make the virus green is the and huge, but the virus has to somehow attach to a protein on the surface of the cell, the of the uh, T cell, the helper or the CD4 cell. So there has to be some kind of protein matching that takes place here. And we call that we call that attaching and fusion of the virus to the uh, to the cell. Now there are cases where people have a mutated version. I think it's CCR5 is one of them. But but there's a mutated version that won't let. Now pay attention to this. There are some people with genetic mutations that won't let the HIV bind to the cell in the first place. Okay? It's kind of a cool kind of a cool little trick. Um, and there are some people that are also immune to to um, bubonic plague for the same reason. But let's say that this happens normally, okay, so and another little secret, there are drugs that will block that and will not let that protein bind, and those are called fusion inhibitors, okay. So, but let's say that this is working the way that um, HIV intended it to work, and so it binds and then the virus is taken up into, into the cell, okay. Now, something has to happen. Remember there is RNA inside that, that virus and so that RNA is released and the RNA is reverse transcribed okay, to form a small DNA strand. Now we already have the host DNA that's in the nucleus. Okay. And what this will do is it will upload. Okay, so this is so this process, first of all, right here, this process right here is called reverse transcription. Okay, that's just what it's called because transcription is usually to make RNA from DNA, right? That's how proteins are made. So this is called reverse transcriptase, where the RNA is actually or reverse transcription, because the RNA is actually forming a DNA strand. Okay, so um, so that happens, and then you have, um, let's see, something called integration, where that newly formed, newly made chunk of viral DNA is uploaded into 
the host's DNA. And so that's what I was mentioning earlier. Now, now this is under control of it. Okay. So now, now you have uh, the what was RNA now is part of the host DNA. It's part of the CD4's genome or genes. Okay. So, so what that does is it causes this to start producing gene products. Okay. So proteins. So it'll form these proteins because that's what DNA does. It forms proteins. And these proteins are viral proteins. They just have to be cut and then they can make a whole bunch of new viruses. Okay, so those proteins will all come together to produce a brand new virus. Okay, so that's what that's the way it all works. So you have fusion, you have reverse transcription, you have integration, and then you have um, you have this um, the production of the new proteins, and then you have proteases which will cut that to make the the proteins needed to build the virus. That's the way it all works. All along the way, so so the way to really know if you understand this is you say, well, let's see, what if I block the fusion? Okay, that's one way that drugs work. What if I block reverse transcription? I'll block this enzyme called reverse transcriptase, and then we won't be, it'll never make the, the DNA. That's another way drugs work. What if we block integration? We never let the DNA that was made into the host DNA. Okay, so there are uh, integrase uh, inhibitors, and so so they block integration. And then we say, okay, all that stuff happened. The virus got in. It made DNA. It uploaded the DNA. Well, let's stop it from being able to cut these proteins here. Okay, so there's there's uh, pro there are proteases that cleave those proteins to make that. Let's say we stop that from happening, okay? So protease inhibitors, and that's what protease inhibitors do. They don't let this part happen. So all along the way, all these steps that I'm naming, all of these are important because this is how drugs work um, on it. So you really need to know this process so it's easier to understand how drugs work later on. All right, um, okay, and this is showing all of those steps as well, this, this slide will. All right, so clinical course, uh, primary infection phase, that's where you are. The patient is infected, um, and they will show signs right away. It's just like any other infection. You've, you, you'll launch an immune response. You've, the uh, immune system detects the presence of the virus. It's a systemic type of response, and, um, and you'll notice it. Okay, So that's going to be a manifestation. So fever, uh, maybe diarrhea, fatigue. Uh, those kinds of those kinds of uh, signs. Zero conversion is actually that's where you, it starts. Um, it uh, starts making antibodies. That's what zero conversion means. It's a fancy word, but it just means that whereas there were no antibodies before, now it has seen the virus and it's producing antibodies against it. Okay, so um, they appear, and that usually takes. That's the primary infection. One to six months to to get through that part of it, and then you have um, the latency phase. And the latency phase is where so you've, you're producing antibodies. So that means if the virus moves out of the cell, out of the T cell, it's going to be attacked by those antibodies. Okay, okay. So that's that's going to kind of keep the virus the detectable virus in the blood very low. And that's what this graph down here is showing. So it's showing the uh, the blue is the viral load. And you can see that when you're first infected, that viral load, a lot of viruses, they're all over the place because you're not fighting it off. And then as you start making antibodies, it starts getting rid of those viruses. And then it drops them down to a really low level. Okay, And it holds it there for 8 to 10 years. And during that 8 to 10 years, the person is contagious and they can pass it on. They aren't showing any symptoms, but they have it. Okay, So when we call that the latency phase, so the viral load is low, the CD4 count has bounced back a little bit because, because the immune system is really trying to control it, but they're still hiding in those CD4 cells. So they're still causing more damage than can be repaired over time, and so then after a long time, 
um, then you start to see the overt AIDS or what we a lot of people just call full-blown AIDS. So you actually get the AIDS diagnosis. Your CD count, cell count is less than 200 cells per milliliter and that defines uh, AIDS itself. So does that, I hope that makes sense. Primary infection, you, you show symptoms, latency phase, no symptoms, but your CD4 count is continuing to drop. Uh, your viral load is pretty low at that point. And then you have overt AIDS and everything flips. The viral load skyrockets and you're, it's just, um, and that's, that's why it's uh, uh, fatal. Okay, uh, so manifestations of uncontrolled HIV, fevers, um, especially in the evening, night sweats, diarrhea, fatigue, weight loss, lymphadenopathy, so swollen lymph, lymph nodes, um, AIDS-associated illnesses. So this is, this is your uh, infection, okay? So when the infection with HIV takes place and your body is fighting it off, it's a pretty typical flu-like kind of a situation, activation of systemic uh, response. There are illnesses associated with AIDS, opportunistic infections, so respiratory diseases like ammonia, pneumonia, things that wouldn't kill normally, um, GI problems, nervous system, fungal infections may happen, things that normally the immune system just, just brushes off without any problem become problems with, with AIDS. And that's ultimately what uh, a lot of times people die from pneumonia that any healthy person with a healthy immune system could fight off. Um, malignancies, Carposi's, um, uh, it's a type of tumor that's pretty specific um, because your immune system, and that's an important point to remember, your immune system fights off tumors. Okay, with If your immune system is compromised, that gives these tumors a chance. Remember that, remember that, okay? Uh, wasting syndrome, so weakness, um, and uh, atrophy, metabolic disorder, so lots of lots of things can happen. All right, so um, most treatments are a combination of drugs, so drug treatment therapies. Most available drugs block reverse transcriptase. So this is the original um, approach is to block that reverse transcriptase, which means uh, the turning the RNA into DNA process. Uh, but now we have drugs that block, you know, the fusion inhibitors doesn't let it in. Uh, protease inhibitors every step of the way where there are drugs and it's quite a regimen of drugs to take some of them some of them you have to take several times a day um, and so yeah it's really compliance is a is a big problem okay um, so reverse transcriptase entry or fusion inhibitors may reduce reduce further progression by preventing entry into cells the really the goal is to improve the quality of life, uh, increase the CD4 count, reduce the viral load, and then reduce HIV-associated morbidity and mortality. And this was such a long video, and I'm so, so sorry, but it's done.